around 1933 up until 1934, 1935, Harlem was main activity was how to make Harlem a congressional district so that Harlem could elect its own congressman. Adam Powell was just began to show his weight. We were fighting to get jobs on 125th Street, fighting to get jobs in our own neighborhood. I admire Adam with all of his faults. He was the best person that black America has ever sent to Washington. He got the job done. When he went to Washington the first time, they told Mr. Powell that we don't accept blacks in the congressional dining room. And Adam smiled and said, mm -hmm. well, you don't accept them. Well, that's your custom. The next day, Adam got the tallest and the meanest looking and the blackest of the blacks he could find and marched them into the congressional dining room as his guest and got away with it. But it was a period when we were reassessing our role in the whole of the Western world. We were tuning into Africa as much as we could and having African forums and making a serious study of African history. Black men wanted to go to Ethiopia and fight on the side of the Ethiopians, but America would not give them passport and let a single one leave the country for that purpose. And yet, Italians could get passports to go and fight with Italian forces against Ethiopia. Now later, some of the same black men who couldn't get permission got permission to go fight in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in Spain. I'm a physician. Physician. And then why would you want to go over in Ethiopia? Well, I feel it's my duty to give my profession and, if necessary, my life in the cause of Ethiopia. And I desire and be happy to die for the defense of entire Africa, including Abyssinia. That's fine. Sign right here on the dotted line. See, originally, Africans did not define themselves by continent, but more by regions. Africa as a continent began to be defined by foreigners. In North Africa, the Romans had a province called Afrique. The word became Africa. The history, both known and hidden, of the land where time began has been a primary focus of Dr. Clark's scholarship throughout his long career. The concept of social order, the concept of an organized society came out of Nile Valley civilization before there was any other society that has been known to man functioning any other place in the world. The significance of Nile Valley civilization is that it was that civilization that set a standard of performance untouched by the other civilizations of the world. And people are reluctant to give an African credit for a creation that happened in Africa. They also forget that the Nile Valley stretches 4,000 miles into the physical body of Africa, and that it was the world's first cultural highway. For centuries, Eurocentric scholars had rejected the idea that the mighty Egyptian empire was in fact created and maintained by black Africans. The concept that Western civilization was the product of non-white intelligence, imagination, technology, and spirituality was unacceptable, both psychologically and politically. A brilliant Senegalese scholar and scientist would shake and many say topple the very foundation of that conventional wisdom. His name was Sheikh Anta Diop. His research was brought to the attention of the English-speaking world through the efforts of his longtime colleague and friend. I was wondering why his books had never been published uh, 
in the United States. He said there was no publisher's interest in his books. And so it took me seven years to interest the publisher in the books of Sheikh Diop. Diop's disciples refer to him as the pharaoh of the Upper Nile. You must be strong enough and serene enough de voir les faits historiques to see the historical facts et de les interpréter correctement. and to in interpret them. Uh, nous pouvons tous être passionnés. We can all be impassioned. Mais ce n'est pas de cette manière que nous résoudrons les problèmes complexes de l'humanité. But that is now how, not how we will resolve the very complex Donc, problems of humanity. Donc cette domination dont nous souffrons, dont j'ai souffert moi-même. The domination that we suffer from, that I have suffered from myself. Notre propre domination des autres races l'a précédé. Our domination of other races preceded it. Donc l'Afrique a exercé un impérialisme continu pendant 4000 ans. For 4000 years Black Africa had an imperialism. Tout l'Afrique occidentale était conquise et était justement sous la domination noire. All of Western Asia was under the domin under the domination of blacks. On n'aurait pu jamais penser à cette époque là que la situation pourrait un jour être renversée. And at that time <laughs> no one would ever have dreamt that the situation could be reversed. C'est pour ça que l'étude de l'histoire l'étude de l'histoire nous redonne la sérénité pour this apprécier is, les faits et les relativiser. This is why the study of history gives us the serenity required to appreciate the facts as they are. 1974, he would challenge the major scholars of the world on the concept of Egypt not being anything other than an African state. In the conference on the peopling of Egypt, leading scholars of the world met and debated most of them wanted to put Egypt's origin outside of Africa. Sheikh Antetio and his protege, Theophil Obenga, placed Egypt within the context of Africa's totality. Sheikh Antetio was more than a historian. He was a scientist, a paleontologist, and he had proven that if he could get the pigment from some of the mummies, he could prove the African origins. All the rest of the conferees came just to disagree. And when it was all over, they had to admit these two men came prepared to prove their case. At that point, they began to close the door to the research of Sheikh and Adio. From the first dynasty to the invasion of Nile Valley, that was the first golden age. And from the third dynasty came the great multi-genius M. Hotel, the real father of medicine, who lived 1,800 years before the Greek who's called the father of medicine. When we read the biography of the Greek, he says, I am a child of M. Hotel. And from the 18th dynasty came the world's great social reformer and maybe one of the world's first deities, Akhenaten. He thought so much of life, he would not crush a flower. He outlawed warfare. Spirituality was a part of the total life of the people. Before the coming of the Europeans, the African was very religious. The Step Pyramid was originally built with a temple at the top where you can go up and pray. This relates not just to the glorification of a pharaoh, but the spiritual outpouring of a people. This is what made the civilization of the Nile so great. At the same time that Egypt was in its 24th dynasty, Europe was just emerging from its preliterate past. The first show of European intelligence was a book called The Artists in the Iliad. That's about 850 B.C. Why is Egypt 850 B.C.? Egypt is old and tired and has gone through 24 dynasties. It is on the eve of its last great dynasty that will come from the pharaohs in the south. 
and the European Adjustment the Book of Folklore. Just south of Egypt lies another highly evolved black society, the Nubians. Their civilization thrived for some 3,000 years. I call the 25th dynasty the one dynasty from the south that moved up north and to tell their cousins, the Egyptians, how to rule a nation one more time in the great show of history. This was Africa's last walk in the sun. It was a great and mighty walk. That walk had lasted 10,000 years. Now it's coming to an end. Europe is just being born. The very word Europe is not even being used. I was drafted to the Army in September 1941. I can say with certainty I was probably one of the best clerks, one of the worst soldiers the Army ever had. I couldn't shoot, didn't like the hot sun, didn't like to go on those all-night trips, but I was a wizard of administration. I made sure my men got what was due to them as soldiers and men not as black men, but as soldiers and men. After I returned from the army, it was not so much as finding myself again as a Pan-Africanist, but redefining myself as a Pan-Africanist. Remember, we had participated in a war that we were cynical about in the first place, and having participated in this war on a Jim Crow bases, getting out of the war, and there wasn't the employment that we had hoped would be there, I began to think more and more about the fact that African people would have to depend on themselves. Pan-Africanism would be perceived as a way to end African dependence on colonial masters a way to create free and independent nations, a way to transfer the continent's immense riches from the hands of invaders into those of the indigenous people of the land. I began to define Pan-Africanism as the building of an African world community, the union of African people in different parts of the world, the African population in India and the Pacific Islands, the African population in the Caribbean and Brazil and South America. And I was looking to the fact that we number a billion people on the face of the earth. If you put them all together and they did one thing in unison, even if it was wrong, it might alter the world. Africa has always been and still is the world's richest continent. Africa has always had things other people wanted, thought they couldn't do without, and didn't want to pay for. So therefore, there's always been an excuse to invade Africa. Alexander's invasion was the first purely European invasion of Africa. Everything that had happened in Egypt and in Africa before 332 BC was something that no European had anything to do with. Now we see the beginning 
of European occupation, and we see it as aggression, not bringing civilization, but destroying civilizations that it did not understand. The uninvited arrival of European armies in the Upper Nile Valley signals the beginning of the end for the highest civilization the world had known. The conquerors, quite literally, changed the complexion of the conquered. Now you're beginning to get a mulatticized population that a whole lot of people keep misinterpreting as white. With each one of these invaders came the bastardization of the population based on the fact that for the sake of pleasure, the foreign soldier heads for the female population at a time the male population has been defeated in war. The Greeks' rule didn't last that long before they were challenged. An ambitious and well-dressed bunch of thugs across the ocean, not very educated, but they could fight like hell, called Romans, <laughs> began to have ambition for the trade in the Mediterranean. Carthage, a powerful black state in North Africa, had imperial ambitions of its own. By the third century BC, its forces had crossed the Mediterranean and established a large province in Spain. The military commander of Carthage had apprehensions about his Roman neighbors and warned his son to keep a watchful eye. Hannibal's father, he would point across the ocean and said, there's some evil people over there. We better bring the war to them before they bring it to us. Hannibal never forget. Hannibal is only 26 when he takes charge of the army. He launches an audacious military adventure, leading his men and their elephants over the Pyrenees Mountains into France, then pointing them across the Alps, boldly, toward Rome itself. Heavy casualties, overextended supply lines, and defection of allies drive Hannibal off the soil of southern Europe. He retreats back home to Carthage. The Romans have made a mission, almost a cult, out of the destruction of Carthage. They would meet each other in the morning. Good morning, Roman citizen. Carthage must be destroyed. Yes, of course, Roman citizen Carthage must be destroyed. Rome's legions clash with Hannibal near Zama. His troops are defeated. Hannibal is sent into exile. His once mighty nation becomes another colony of Rome and an administrative center for their empire. Now, the Roman Empire internally was not very rich. Africa became the breadbasket for the Roman Empire. And except for Africa, the Roman Empire would not have been able to sustain itself. Now, the Roman presence in North Africa is going to force into being one of the great events in human history. Roman taxation, Roman oppression would cause people to turn to new gods and question old gods, to turn to a story about a god who comes forth to rescue them. Now they would draw from African folklore the story of the child in the manger. Now, what am I saying? Later, in retrospect, he was referred to as Jesus Christ. Now, you can argue about the coloration of Christ if you want to, but I can sell that very quick, and we can go on to the next subject. Was he a Roman? The answer is no. Was he a Greek? The answer is still no. 
These were the only European types in that part of the world at the time. If it was neither Roman or Greek, it was one of those other people. And all of those other people were non-European and non-white. <laughs> and he came from the other people.